I hope we can all say that when we're said and done. So I'm going to ask if you do it, if you would read this with me again. Are you ready? One, two, three. I have fought the good fight. Turn to your neighbor and say, fight the good fight. Amen. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your the praise and worship, Lord. We ask you right now to just continue to take control of the service, Holy Spirit. There may be people right now here concerned, worried, anxious, depressed. There may be people here on their last rope, Father God, ready to break. And they came to the right house, not because it is lifeline, but because it is a place of the Holy Spirit, Lord. And you are the healer. You will mend any broken heart, Father God. And we thank you in advance for what you're doing in our lives and you continue to do in our lives. And we just thank you, Lord. So Holy Spirit, do your thing today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray with somebody say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Anybody tired today? Awesome. Thank you for being honest. I'm on the same boat. I'm kind of tired today. And the scripture says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I remained faithful. You know what, church? Something that I have learned is that we're, we're really good at starting stuff. Everybody's good at starting stuff, but we're terrible at finishing it. And as we finish this last piece of integrity, we're going to continue talking in the life of Daniel. But it's interesting to me how we start. We're great starters. Everybody wants to start a diet. Everybody wants to start to work. I'm going to start Monday. Why, why Monday? Have you ever asked yourself that? People say, well, Monday, because it's, it's the worst day of the week. I mean, when you think about it. I mean, start today, right? But it's funny how I'm going to start Monday. Everybody always wants to say Monday. And we're good at starting stuff and we have great ideas and we have great plans. But when it flops or doesn't work out the way it should or it starts raining, well, it's a little too cold to go running today. It's a little too sweaty in the gym. They, they didn't fix the air condition. Well, I thought that was the whole point of working out was to sweat. And so we'll find different reasons. And I, I'm talking about lifting and, and exercising, but really in, in life in general, we start something and it... Maybe one or two days, three days, maybe a week or so. And then we're like beating ourselves up. We're like, God, I didn't do it. I couldn't finish. I, I didn't make it. You know? And so we have dreams that are half filled. We got goals that are half accomplished. And we have business that is unfinished. And so I want to encourage you today. If, if I could finish this title of integrity Today's title would be Finish Strong. Finish Strong. Amen? So let's continue in the life of Daniel because I truly believe this is going to bless you. We studied chapter 1 when we talked about, uh, about standing firm. We talked about chapter 2 when we said that Daniel gave God the credit. Be careful who you give the credit to. I skipped 3. 3 is a very common one of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they're facing the furnace. And I wanted to skip 6 which is the one of the lion's den, because those are very popular. So I wanted to hit the ones that are rarely talked about. And so today I'm going to hit chapter 5. Watch what it says in verse 1. Many years later. How many years later? Stay awake, church, because we only got 29 minutes left. Many years later, King Belshazzar, it says, there gave a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. Let me just stop right there. The kingdom has changed. If you... If you've been paying attention to this series, you notice that here it says King Belshazzar. It doesn't say King Nebuchadnezzar. When we talked about Daniel 1 and 2 and even 3, you will see that Nebuchadnezzar was in the picture. He was the king, but apparently something has happened because chapter 5 starts off by saying many years later. The kingdom has changed. Daniel has found himself in a world that has passed him by. 
If you remember Nebuchadnezzar, or, or I should say Daniel found favor in the king of Nebuchadnezzar, standing faithful and standing firm in integrity. What did Nebuchadnezzar to do to Daniel? He says, I'm going to make you the king. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to make you the ruler of my sorcerers, and I'm going to make you head of all my magicians. And, and all that is great and done, and he does a great job, and he stays faithful, and he remains adamant about his faith in God. And no matter how bad it seemed, and even sometimes it looked like he was going to die, he stayed faithful. But his position has changed. Now it's a different kingdom. Now Belshazzar has taken over. He has assumed the authority of the king. The city is strong, but the kingdom is weak. How many of you know that the United States is a great country, but we're weak right now? We're weak right now. If you haven't figured that out yet, we're not as united as we used to be. It only takes me back to 9-11. When everybody and their mother was waving American flags. You remember that? I never forget when 9-11 happened. We didn't have to ask people to come to prayer. The church was full. Why church do we have to wait for tragedy? Why do we have to wait for things to happen to get united? And so here in verse 2, watch what it says in verse 2. It says, well, Belshazzar was drinking the wine. He gave orders to bring the gold and silver cups and and that his predecessor Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. Puro spring break action here. In the worst time of idolatry, in the worst time of co corruption, rather than for him to seek God's favor and repent of his way, he throws a party. He throws a party with godly material things. He throws a party with things that were uh, 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 separated and segregated for holy rituals. He, it's almost like if this sound and this instrument, it's been anointed, we've prayed for it. This is our sound system that you faithful tithers and earth have, have caused us to buy. Thank you to that. We have our equipment now. But imagine if all of a sudden we just turned this stuff over and somebody came over and said, you know what, we're going to start doing crazy parties and wet t-shirt contests and we're going to take this out to spring break. I know I got your attention real quick. We said, wet, wet t-shirt contest? What happened, Pastor Rick? Can you imagine if we used everything that was holy and we turned it for evil? That's exactly what was happening here. He used the, it says there, he used the cups of gold and silver and he used them that Nebuchadnezzar had left. This king was full of pride and he says, I'm going to throw a banquet. Watch what it says in verse 3. So they brought the gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. Verse 4, while they drank, check this out, church. While they drank from, from them, it says, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Verse 5, suddenly, somebody say suddenly. They saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, verse 6, and his face turned pale with fright, his knees knocked together in fear, and his legs give, gave way beneath him. Now watch this. This is interesting because you can't outsmart God. You can't uh, uh, think that you're going to try to do something and make him look like a fool. Better yet, let me just say this. God doesn't need us to defend him. We, we, we are so caught up in, in competing with each other and competing with other churches and competing with so much stuff that, no, it's this way and God's this way. And then when people from the outside, from the world per se, uh, don't, you know, do something, oh no, we go against them and we bash them and we thrash them and we do all this and, and we try. No, we got to defend the church. We got to, guys, let me tell you something. The church was here before you were born. And it will be here after you're gone. God does not need your help to defend the church. He just needs you to be faithful. Can I have an amen on that? All right. So in the, this miraculous, or, or I'm sorry, in this crazy party, God miraculously stops the party at its high point. And the Bible clearly says that while they were drinking and praising these false gods, as we said, bronze, iron, wood, 
gold, silver. These gods that were man-made in the midst of the party. The king was so filled, the king that was so filled with pride and arrogance began to tremble. And the Bible says that his knees began to knock. Why? Because as they were drinking, it wasn't just fingers. It was the hand of God writing on the wall. Can you imagine that sight? And it doesn't say, when you read the true translation, it says that the, the, it wasn't the whole hand, but just the fingers of God began to write on the wall by the lampstand. I'm sure Belshazzar was like, oh my God, this stuff, we're not drinking this stuff anymore. It's making me see things. He's like, no, no more of this fine wine. Forget that. Bring the other stuff. Because I'm starting to see fingers writing on the wall. It, it wasn't an illusion. It wasn't a vision. God was in the house. God was in the house. <laughs> to the point that he lost control of his lower extremities. His knees were knocking. <laughs> Watch what it says in verse 7. The king shouted for the enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers to be brought before him. He said to these wise men, whoever can read this writing and tell me what it means will be dressed in purple robes of royal honor and will have a gold chain placed around his neck. He will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Verse 8, but when all the king's wise men had come in, none of them could read the writing or tell them what it meant. Verse 9, so the king grew even more alarmed and his face turned pale. His nobles too were shaken. Verse 10, but when the queen mother, watch this, when the queen mother heard that was what was happening, she hurried to the banquet, banquet hall. She said to Belshazzar, long live the king. Don't be so pale. Don't get your underwear all fired up. Don't be frightened. Verse 11, there is a man in your kingdom who has within him the spirit of the holy gods. During Nebuchadnezzar's reign, this man was found to have insight, understanding, wisdom like that of the gods. Your predecessor, the king, your predecessor, the king Nebuchadnezzar, made him chief over all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers. Let me tell you, this woman, she says, I remember a man when Nebuchadnezzar was king. I remember his name was Daniel. There's a man, and just in case Belshazzar had forgotten, maybe he never realized her, maybe he never met him, or maybe he never heard of him, this woman remembers. I'm here to tell you that God remembers. I'm telling you here that God remembers. What we do in private, God will honor us in public. When we worship, when we praise Him, when we honor Him, even when it looks like the, the war is over, even when it looks like you've lost, even when it looks like things are going sour and you continue to remain faithful, people may have forgotten, but God remembers. And many years had passed. And, and it almost seemed like Daniel had been washed away. It almost seemed like he was forgotten for he was about 80 years old at this point. Somebody will look at his age and say, now, oh, he's too old to serve. But as like I told you Sunday, serving and maturity has nothing to do with age. Daniel was a man of integrity. And people may forget this or that. People may forget certain dates and that, but they'll never forget what the power of God shows them. And this woman said, uh-uh, he's in your kingdom. He's right under your nose and his name is Daniel. Forget your enchanters. Forget your, your sorcerers and your magicians. Call this, call it, call him up, call him up. Send him a text for God's sake. And watch what it says in verse 12. I'm going to read 12 and then I'm going to skip for the sake of time. This man, Daniel, verse 12, who the king named... Uh, Belteshazzar. So don't confuse that with Belteshazzar. This was Belteshazzar and this has exceptional ability and is filled with divine knowledge and understanding. He can interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel and he will tell you what the writings means. And it's interesting because he was brought before him. And I'm going to skip over to verse 17 or actually 16. Please put 16. He brings him forward and he says, I am told that you can give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read these words and tell me what the meaning is, you will be clothed in purple robes, royal honor, and you will have a gold chain placed around your neck. You will become third highest in the kingdom. But watch what Daniel says in verse 17. Daniel answered the king, keep your gifts. 
People of integrity can't be bought. I'm going to say that again. People of integrity can't be bought. He says, keep your gifts or give them to someone else. But I will tell you what the writing means. Verse 18, your majesty, the most high God gave you sovereignty, majesty, glory, and honor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He's telling them who made Nebuchadnezzar king. God did not make Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, sorry, Nebuchadnezzar did not make himself king. God had placed him there. You're saying, Pastor, where are you going with this? I'm going to tie it all up. You're going to see what I'm telling you right now. God had put him there. Verse 19, he made him so great that people of all races and nations and languages trembled before him. He killed those he wanted uh, to, uh, he wanted to, and then it goes on to say, those that he wanted to honor and disgrace, those that he wanted to disgrace. But watch what it says in verse 20. But when his heart and his mind were puffed up with arrogance, he was brought down from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. Verse 21, he was driven from human society. He was giving the mind, the mind of a wild animal. And he lived among the wild donkeys. He ate grass like a cow and he was drenched with the dew of heaven until he learned that the most high God rules over the kingdoms of the world and appoints anyone who desires to rule, uh, rule over them. This guy, Daniel, is going off on the king and saying pretty much, hey, Nebuchadnezzar used to be just like you, puffed up with pride and arrogance. And God had to humble him. What are you waiting for? This is Daniel, a man who would say he's done, he's already over, he's over the hill. But he still was faithful. He was not fearful. Stay with me. Verse 22. You are his successor, O Belshazzar. And you knew all of this, yet you have not humbled yourself. Verse 23. For you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have had these cups from the temple brought before you. You and your nobles and your wives, and yada, 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 yada. Verse 24. So God has sent me, sent this hand to write this message. And now watch, he starts breaking up the dream. Watch what he says that the dream means in verse 25. This is the message that was written. Many, he says, many, tekel, and parson. This is what the words mean. Mene means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. 27. Tikolitis means weighed. You have been weighed on the balances and have not measured up. 28. Parson means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. This was the writing on the wall. This is exactly what, 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 the, what the interpretation was. You would have thought Daniel, like us today, would have wanted to be uh, politically correct. You see, we live in a nation where if you say the wrong thing, if you wear the wrong shirt, if you're praising God where you shouldn't be doing, you're going to be thrown down. But, God, but, but, but Daniel was like, oh, you don't understand. He's already saved me from beheadings. He's already saved me from the furnace. You think I'm about to be afraid of you? He says, I'm going to tell you what that dream meant because you called me and I'm not here to lie to you and I'm not here to bring you down or I'm just simply here to tell you the truth. The king was going to die. The kingdom was divided and Daniel faithfully delivered bad news. But like I said, he wasn't worried about making waves. He wasn't worried about being politically correct. And I, I tell you right now, church, when we start worrying what God says and stop focusing on what people say, we'll be more effective. We will be more effective, church, when we start putting more attention into what God wants us to do, God wants us to say, rather than, oh, but if I do this, I'm going to offend this family. Oh, but if I do this, I'm, this is going to happen. Oh, but if I do this, I might lose my, lose everything, but do not lose your salvation. And don't be bought out, church. Don't be sold out. Don't be sold out by money. Don't be sold out by power. Don't be sold out by promotion. Don't be manipulated by certain things that you feel like if you have this, well, I, I, I can't stand for what I believe because I may lose my job. I can't stand for what I believe because I may lose my relationship. You've already lost it. Because the most important relationship here today is the relationship that you have with God. Take the house, take the house, take the car, take the job, but don't you take away my relationship with God. Because it is my God that will provide the next house, the next blessing, the next car, so on and so forth. We gotta stop worrying, church. I'm afraid to speak up. I'm afraid to stand firm. I'm afraid. I'm not saying get on a bullhorn and start condemning people. That's not what I'm saying. All I'm saying, church, is stand for what you believe. 
Even if the whole room begins to criticize you. Even if you seem like the oddball. Even if you seem like the leftover. Now don't, don't invite him to the party. I remember that was me, church. I'll never forget. I was in band. Yes, I was in band. I'll never forget. And the, and the band students were having parties. Yes, band students had parties then too. And I'll never forget. A good friend of mine, he, he was a he was a friend. Well, we're going to have a party, but I didn't want to invite you because I know you're not, you're not going to go because Fridays you have prayer. Here you do. And we're going to go Monday night here, but I know you're not going to go because your parents are going to let you. And we were going to go. And so we just stopped inviting you. So I never went to any parties. Never got an invitation. I didn't even have the permission to say no. They never even got the invitation. But I'll tell you what it did do. When it was time to be around a group, respect. They knew what I stood for. I may not have had 400 friends. It must have been the most popular. Oh, well, most likely to succeed in the yearbook. Believe me, youth, if you're here today, those things that you see 20 years from now, it won't work. <laughs> the ones that you think are the most beautiful, oh, don't even get me started. And the ones that are the most popular, 7-Eleven, daddy. And the ones more to succeed, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, be careful with the quiet ones. Be careful with the ones that have been minding their own business. Be careful with the ones that have been working hard with B's and C's because they become the lawyers, they become the doctors, they become the next teacher. Respect. Respect. And it's interesting here because Daniel says, I don't care about being politically correct. I'm here to tell you that this is the dream. You're up, king, and your pride is destroyed you. Watch what it says in verse 29. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes. A gold chain was hung around his neck, big like a big clock, like Tupac. That's how I picture it. I don't even know it's Tupac. I don't even know why I said that. Thank you. Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg? Favorite flag? Ah, holy rollers, but you didn't know the name of Nebuchadnezzar. Watch, watch, watch. It's going to get good in just a second. You're saying, man, Pastor, you're just reading a lot. Oh, hold on. I'm going to get down in a minute. So the gold chain was hung around him like run DMC around his neck. And he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. He didn't want the gifts. And he had given bad news. And the king still promoted him. <laughs> There's benefits in being faithful, church. Daniel is promoted. His reward is quite different. But watch what it says in verse 30. That very night, that very night after the dream, Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, was killed. When God speaks, things happen, church. When we speak his name, things happen, church. There is power still today in the name of Jesus. Some of you may not believe it, but there is power. If I can go deeper, Daniel did not become a man of integrity at age 80. He was already at age 20. You, you, you see, integrity is not a fad. It's not a season. Daniel says, I was 20 and I was going strong and things changed and I was ahead of the head and maybe they tossed him to the side. He wasn't popular no more. And Daniel didn't say, well, I'm not that popular anymore. Nobody's really looking. Nobody's really watching. That's when everyone's watching. You see, people don't look at you when the cameras are on. People are looking at you when the cameras aren't around. What are you really doing when you think no one is looking? What are you really doing when all hell breaks loose at home? What are you really doing when tragedy strikes your family? Let's see if you really preach and you really walk the talk that you've been saying. Let's see if that guy you call faithful is really there. I want to see how he reacts when he loses his job. I want to see how he reacts when he hears this tragic news. I want to see how he reacts when things don't work in his favor. Daniel says, I can be 80 or 80, but I'm going to remain faithful. And when the time was right, he said, I started and I'm going to finish what I started. He finishes strong. He was the same in the beginning. He was the same at the end. Timothy 4, 7. I'm going to read it again so you can understand a little bit more of where I'm going. The same verse that I started with is the same verse that I want to finish with. Daniel could honestly have said, I have fought the good fight. 
I have finished the race and I have remained faithful? Question mark. I'm going to ask you the question. What would God say about you today if you were to be gone? What would he say about you? Did you, did you waver? Did you quit? Were there certain things that God had given you an opportunity? God says, I'm going I'm to set everything up. All I need you to do is just walk through it. Don't quit. Would God be able to say of you today, well, job, you finished the race. Good and faithful servant. All right, let's bring it down to earth. What would your spouse say about you? What would your kids say about you? Well, my dad was doing good, but this happened and then he went down and he's, he's kind of failed. He's, he's kind of not really moved on. What would your spouse say about you? Man, I used to love about him that he used to do this and persevere, but now he's quit. Things don't look right. Think that the, the divorce was final and, uh, and you know what? We're just done. I'm here to tell you that it's not over until God says it's over. It says there, I have fought the good fight. If you missed that phrase right there, then you missed today's sermon. You got to fight for it. It doesn't say I have prayed the good fight. It says I have fought the good fight. I'm here to tell you women, I'm here to tell you men, that your hair may get a little bit tangled, you may break a certain heel, your dress may tear, you may get a few black eyes and a few uh, scratches here and there, but you said, I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting. I'm going to continue to persevere. Why? Because there's someone that is watching. There's someone that's depending on your ability not to quit to be able to tear, carry that family over. You have the power in your hands to carry the blessing to you, to them, and to the third generation. You can't quit right now, church. There's somebody right now depending on you that you don't quit. Oh, y'all not hearing what I'm saying? You see, Jesus could have said when he, when he got first beaten, he could have said, well, I can't really take this beating. But he didn't do that. He continued until the next day. Had not eaten, he had been ridiculed. He had been spit on. And now they put the crown of thorn on his head. And then if that didn't matter, they put the 39 lashes and they whipped him to nearly death. He could have said, I'm finished, but he says, I'm not done yet because 2014 is going to come and there's going to be people at our power that need to understand that if I can persevere through the pain, they need to understand they can't quit when their patty holes tear. And so Jesus kept going and then they said, well, now after the beating, you got to carry the cross. He can't say, oh, you know what? I'm finished here. I'm not going to. No. What did he do? He carried the cross. And if you don't understand, you will understand then that Jesus even fell down after carrying the cross. I'm trying to tell you, church, you're going to fall. You're going to fall. He fell. But God sent someone named Simon, who wasn't even a disciple, who happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm here to tell you, God will send you people to help you. All you got to do is stand up. And someone helped Jesus, and Jesus helped him in the cross. And he's like, what are you doing? And this guy was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing here. I was just coming by to the store. But something told me to come this way and help you. God still has angels today, church. But we don't see the angels because we've already quit before we even started. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get beaten. You're gonna, you're, you might even get a little bit depressed. You might get a little bit angry. You're not seeing the results. But you're carrying the cross. You cannot quit. And then Jesus finally gets on the cross. He gets on the cross. And if that's not enough, they have to put the nails. They have to put the nails on his feet and his head. He could have said, all right, Jesus. He could have said, all right, Father, really? Enough. But he didn't. He continued and he persevered. Through the pain, through the ridicule, being dehydrated, losing almost every ounce of blood until he hung on the cross for hours. Why? For you. For me. So you have no excuse to quit. It was God. It was Jesus that had the authority. He says, I know when I'm done. It's when he hung and he said, it is finished. Church, you have that power. But we keep quitting too soon. 
and we're not finishing what we started. I'm telling you right now, if God started something in your life, you don't have permission to finish it. You don't have permission to quit. You don't have permission to give up. God says, I will do that. You just need to get up. You just need to walk. You just need to shake that dirt off your knees and continue to press on. I did not give you the spirit of fear. I did not give you the spirit to quit. Yes, you're going to get hurt. Yes, your feelings are going to be crushed a little bit. But I got someone named the Great Counselor, and his name is the Holy Spirit. Would you ask him for help? Would you ask him to come and help you? And if you do, God says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I'm talking to somebody right now that needs to have their faith a little bit injection you've been dropped you've been rejected you've been criticized and ostracized but God says it's not over until I say that it's over give the Lord a praise offering stand to your feet church Jesus didn't quit on you why should we quit on him Turn to your neighbor and say, don't quit on Jesus. Don't quit on Jesus. He didn't quit on you, so why are we going to quit on him? As we worship and we sing this song, would you bow your heads right there where you're at? If you felt to quit, if you feel like you've already thrown in the towel, you better pick that towel up. It's not over yet. We're just taking a break. And let me tell you right now, God doesn't have a problem with you stopping. He doesn't have a problem with you taking a break. He doesn't have a problem with you taking a drink. He doesn't have a problem. But you can't not quit. You have to finish. And if you need to get your friend next to you, those good friends, not the friends that throw you the pity party, those friends that will slap you and say, you can't quit now, girl. Those are the type of friends you need. The ones that will wake you up, the ones that will take you, the ones that will take you here or bring you there, and will say, no matter what happens, you're not quitting. You've come too far to quit. Bow your heads, church, and just begin. Begin to worship Him. Integrity comes with the price, church. We have to stop giving up so quickly. This generation quits too soon. If you have any any fight left in you, I dare you to praise him right now and lift it in your hands and just worship him with you, church. Daniel didn't let his age get in the way. circumstances dictate what was going to happen he remained faithful we got to remain faithful church worship him church I dare you to worship him and say the most beautiful